Uh, well, um, I'm going to get us started here tonight. My name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas. And um, we've been doing the Big Texas Read now for the last two years with Jim and I Inc. down in San Antonio. And this was kind of the brainchild and idea of David Samuel Levinson, who was our first author on the Big Texas Read. And I, um, we, we've just been going strong every month since then. Um, if you don't know about Writing Workshops Dallas, we're a writing center in Dallas and we offer classes in fiction, poetry, nonfiction and screenwriting. And really for the last two years, um, along with Gemini Inc, um, the, the Big Texas Read has been sponsored um, very lovingly by Humanities Texas, by the UT Austin San Antonio, I'm sorry, the, U, the UT San Antonio Library System, um, also uh, Lone Star Literary, and then our, our bookstores that we always love to give a shout out, The Twig down in San Antonio and also in Terrabang. Um, which I was at last night, beautiful bookstore here in Dallas. So we love to support our independent bookstores. Um, so thank you for being here tonight. I know a lot of things are opening up, but for the foreseeable future, we're, we're still gonna be on Zoom with the Big Texas Read or doing something hybrid, but it's been a real joy to work with um, my new friends down in San Antonio um, with Jim and I Inc and Alexandra Vandekamp. And I'm gonna throw Lorinda to tell you all a little bit about Jim and I Inc and then we'll have David Samuel Les, uh, Levinson introduce our featured guests tonight, but thank you for being here. Florinda? Thank you, Blake. Um, yeah, my name is Florinda Flores Brown and I am the Director of Programs at Gemini Inc. And um, if you're not familiar with Gemini Inc, we're San Antonio's Writing Arts Center. And our mission is to teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. Now, for those of you who have joined us before, I'm sure that you are familiar with Ale Alexander Van de Kamp, our Executive Director. Um, we didn't want to let Alexandra have all the fun at the tech, Big Texas Read, so some Gemini Inc. staff are going to be rotating in and out. Tonight is my first night. I'm super excited to be here. Um, and one thing that I did want to say is a core value at Gemini Inc. is creating connection, and whether that's among writers that are everywhere in Texas, across the country, um, as well as connecting with literary organizations like uh, writing workshops Dallas. So please partake in community in the chat. Uh, please post any questions that you have. There is a Q&A at the end or any comments that you wanna share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Welcome to your initial initiation into the Big Texas Read. Um, I'm really happy that everyone is here. I wanna thank Blake and Alexandra for really being the nuts and bolts to this entire event um, every month. I basically do nothing but introduce the writers, so I'm happy to do that, which I'm going to do right now. So we'll start with our incredible moderator, I've, whom I've known for quite a while, I feel like. Um, she has totally disappeared from the screen. Where did she go? Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, her name is Elizabeth McCracken, and she's the author of seven books. Here's Your Hat, What's Your Hurry, The Giant's House, Niagara Falls All Over Again, An Exact Replica of a Figment of My Imagination, Thunderstruck and Other Stories, Bowl Away, and the forthcoming collection of short stories, The Souvenir Museum. She's received grants and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts the Liguria Study Center, the American Academy in Berlin, the Fine Arts, Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Thunderstruck and Other Stories won the 2015 Story Prize, which is amazing. Her work has been published in the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize, the O'Henry Prize, the New York Times Magazine, and many other places. You can find her rather often, entirely too often, really, on Twitter. And um, th that was Elizabeth McCracken. And uh, our featured writer is uh, Deb Olin Unferth, whose novels and short story collections are widely celebrated as wickedly comic and cutting edge. She's the author of six books of fiction and nonfiction. Her most recent book is the novel Barn Eight, published by Gray Wolf in 2020, named a best book of 2020 by NPR, Slate, Austin Chronicle and Literary Hub. Her most recent uh, short story collection is Wait Till You See Me Dance 
by Grey Wolf in 2017, which the New York Times says swerves from the mundane to the extraordinary, from biting to soaringly celebratory. Uh, we love having them both here. And without further ado, please unmute yourselves and get to your conversation. Deb. Hi, I can't see you. Oh, there, oh, wait, here I am. Oh, there you are. <laughs> it popped up on my own screen. I'm so happy to be talking to you. I was looking down during David's um, introduction because my internet went off. And so I have a, a phone I can use as a hotspot, which occasionally I have to do. Whoa, um, terrible. I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you um, because I love this book so much and I love your work so much. And also because the last literary thing I did before the world shut down was we were at Book People together on the Monday of the week that the world shut down. Or maybe it was the Tuesday. I think it was the Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. It was Tuesday. And then by Friday, the world had shut down. Yeah. On Wednesday, yeah. we went to the movies together. And then I know, that was amazing. <laughs> we went to the movies. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm so grateful to you for doing this with me. You're just, you know, absolutely one of my favorite people to read and to talk to about literature. So this is just great. Thanks. Um, congratulations on everything that's happened to the book in the two years. I think we we maybe we talked on on pub day. Two yeah, years I think we did. Time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm particularly excited for this conversation because it's a book club so we can talk about sort of all parts of the book um because it's a really for those of you who haven't read it we're about to spoil it for you but also i will say that it's this very complicated intricate book that does everything it's funny it's moving um it jumps through time and across points of view um and i i would like to start just by asking you, like, what was the first glimmer of this book? Oh, um, let's see. So I think that the first glimmer of this book, you know, it's been a, a while since I really talked about this book. So um, I think that maybe it was the idea of you know, so I'm vegan and I'm pretty horrified by the way that uh, chickens are treated and like those giant factory farms. And um, I had this image of a giant barn and a factory farm just lifting off and all of the birds flying out of it, which doesn't even make any sense because chickens obviously don't really fly. Well, they can fly a few feet. Um, and I don't know, I, I always think of those moments as what I call initias and where it's like there's just like an initial little spark and that just won't stop bothering you and that you just keep kind of, keeps kind of coming back. And it felt like such an image of like grace and of um, and it was funny because the idea of, you know, chickens flying is kind of ridiculous and it was um, like it was grand in scale, like it was huge. It just, it had all of this kind of stuff in it. And so, you know, so something like that, I mean, I, I don't know, it just kept haunting me and I really wanted to unpack it. And then it was like, what if, what if we could just, you know, what if we could just stop factory farming? You know, like, what if we could do that? And of course we can't do that. But then I thought, what if, what if we could just, stop it on one farm you know so and that kind of became the main character that became her fantasy jane that she well not really her fantasy but like the dream that she had when she was in the farm which turns out to be the dream of these chickens who are dying they're they're like dreaming that they're you know that they are flying out in a big fire so I have about a million follow-up questions now. Um, one of the things that I, I'd love you to talk about is that, I, I don't know, we both teach at the University of Texas. Um, I went to, I'm older than you and went to graduate school a million years ago. Um, and one of the things that I've thought about a lot recently 
is the things that we were taught as true that I, some of which I cast off then and, and others that I think, oh, why did I believe that for so long? And one of the things that we were told was that you, sh not only should you not write a novel um, because you wanted to say something big, but you should keep politics out of your fiction altogether. That fiction was no place for politics, um, which I, I disagreed with early on, but I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about like sort of the, the uses and responsibilities of fiction for social issues. That is such a good question. And I'm just trying to remember, have you and I talked about this already or not? I don't think so. Because I mean, I know someone else who I talked to, another writer who I went to school with, um, who we talked about this not that long ago. And, and I just, the two of us just sat there and said, why were we taught that? That was so <laughs> crazy. And we thought, geez, like, I wonder if other writers were taught that. And I thought, yeah, I think that they were. And there, here you are saying, yeah, exactly. And you were like on the other side of the country. So yes, for those young people who are here, we were taught that we were not supposed to be writing about politics. And that is it's really standard. strange to me. It's very strange. Not just not just not about politics, but we weren't really supposed to write about like about like morality or ethics or you know about like big like big ideas. It was supposed to stay small and um that seems so weird to me and i can only think that it was in reaction to the 60s like it was reactionary or um i mean i don't know why that was the case but um i yeah i mean of course now you know times have changed things are different and you know we all want to write about big ideas we all want to write about um things that um are going wrong and then are important to us and um and i and i feel like um i feel like there's so much amazing fiction being written that is i mean of course you know like climate change is a really big one and um you know issues surrounding race are you know really important um so i feel like it's happening like it's happening a lot now like a lot and so the idea that that that's what we were taught i mean i guess that that's important right that like fiction is fiction is changing and that the way that it's taught is changing and that you know there's we're going to go through all of these different phases and that that should make us humble as teachers like that what we're saying now we might really react against um in you know 20 years or 10 years so um so so it's probably good you know like keep keep fiction moving and changing and growing in class today we read this book um senselessness by horacio castellanos moya have you read it mm -hmm. so um it's about these massacres that took place in um guatemala in the 80s and it has a decidedly hands-off approach in a sense and the character is really he's he's very unlikable he's quite immoral in many ways and yet he's engaged on this quest and i did keep thinking to myself like i don't know if this book could be written now because he's so unlikable and he's so just like anti-mission he's such an anti-hero so yeah so that's what i would have to say about that it's it's interesting because I think fiction does grow and expand, and also it's important to remember that there are fashions and trends in it, and that we happen to start writing when the when the fashion was, oh, you have to concentrate on the personal. But you know, for any pan, fan of Grace Paley, you know that that politics can light something up. Mm -hmm. So right. do you do you. Do, what do you feel like you'd like to accomplish in your fiction or how again how do you think of like the responsibility of of fiction's ability to talk about social issues or just big ideas i mean i feel like it's really it's an it's important to explore whatever it is that i mean we're in a moment where um the global feels really close 
So I think that we're all going to be writing and thinking about these big ideas and, and, you know, and it, it feels really scary right now. So I think, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine someone just um, writing something about um, something that's what they consider to be solely personal. Um, but I don't, I don't know if, if anyone has like a responsibility to that. I mean, you know, I feel like people should write whatever they want, like whatever they want is going to be the thing that comes out as urgent. And it feels, um, it feels really phony to, you can tell in a text when it's like, oh, I feel like I should have, you know, a non-binary couple in here, you know, like you can feel it like on the page if it's just sort of been placed there for some reason. Um, but I think that we should all just be writing about the thing that, that fills us with like passion, um, love, rage, um, the thing that, you know, that drives us. Um, I mean, don't you feel that way or what do you think? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Um, but I, and I also think one of the things that, that has changed for me as I've gotten older is that um, I feel like fiction can accomplish more. Like it's more ambitious to say that it can, that you can write about anything that you want to, including books, novels that are commentaries on our, our time. Cause I mean, I, I want to talk about time in this book. Um, but it's very interested in talking about our, our, our current moment, which was another thing that we were dissuaded from doing when we were young, or at least not in my, that you were supposed to try to make something as timeless as possible. And I can't think of anything worse than trying to denude a novel of all reference to anything, but that's, that's what we were supposed to do for some reason. Totally. And yeah, I completely agree with you. Like that, um, because of the, like how political we become, I feel like if we are writing from a, and, and because we, we're, we seem to be so aware of where we're placed in culture now and in society that if we do just write about the personal, it's going to, it's going to be political. And if we do write about, um, you know, big ideas, it's going to wind up applying to, you know, really, it's going to get very micro into individual lives. So I feel like there isn't really a way around that anymore. I, I will also say that when I was in graduate school, um, 1988 to 1990, um, my classmates and I were overwhelmingly white, straight, cis writers who had um, the privilege of thinking, oh, well, you know, social things have no effect on my life, really, or on my art, at least. So um, one, of the, one of the other great joys of growing older is seeing writing programs and um, finally publishing as well, becoming more diverse. And so necessarily talking about, about the pol political and the personal. Um, I wanna talk about Janie. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a highly populated book, but she feels very much the heart of it. Um, and you, the, the, the book treats her a little differently in that it, it opens up with her life story or an important chunk of it. And um, I'd love you to talk about her as a character and also that decision. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So Janie kind of, yeah, she like starts the book and then she, it's kind of like you're tricked when you're reading the book. Like you think that this is, oh, this is gonna definitely be about Janie. And then, you know, it's gonna be like, like, young woman finds her father and forges a relationship or something. But then as it goes on, you know, like more characters and more characters. And I was, I thought a lot about the structure. Like I really wanted it to look, to feel like that. Um, and, um, but yeah, I did keep coming back to Janie. I mean, Janie's the only one who really doesn't know anything about the egg industry because she's not an activist. She's not a, um, you know, she's, she doesn't work for the industry. Um, I mean, she does eventually get a job part time, you know, like she, she gets a job there, but she's not, you know, she hasn't been doing it for very long. And um, so she doesn't, um, 
you know, so she's kind of, she kind of takes the place of us, you know, that we're sort of the people who come in that we don't really know anything about this. And then just kind of as you go through the book, she starts to start to really care about these animals and about these people and about the situation. And, um, you know, and she finds a lot of um, kind of, she finds like a way into um, her own life by looking at all of these different lives around her and looking at this and really it's all her idea. So she kind of kicks off the book and then she is mad because they are sort of taking over the book. Um, they're kind of taking over the heist and then it kind of ends with her and yeah, you kind of keep coming back to her. So in a sense, it's like, it's like, and, and there's a lot of characters like that, but I feel like the two who kind of hold it that way or how I imagined it was Janie and the relationship with her father, which at the very end, you find out how that turns out. And then there's this chicken who appears at the beginning of the book. And then you kind of see what happens to this chicken throughout the book, who's a much smaller passages for the chicken. But, um, but I did kind of want it to be like, Janie's slowly learning about the chicken. We're slowly learning about the chicken and, you know, and the chicken's conversation, um, you know, and that's kind of driving us toward the end of the book, even though, even though there are so, there's just the, the, the structure of the book is just opening and opening and opening. I love that. Cause I did, I didn't feel tricked, um, but it, the, the book starts with this, I wouldn't say it's traditional because I mean, because nothing about your work is, it all feels so innovative and, and unfirthy, specifically unfirthy. And, but you spend a lot of time with, with Jade, this character, Janie, um, and it does feel like part of the message of the book is that in any species, if you isolate one member of that species, you will grow to love that character. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so you're with Janie and then it zags suddenly. And this, the, if you can talk about the structure, cause it's, it's made up of sort of, um, I'm trying to avoid the word traditional again, but a close third person narrative with Janie. And then there are parts that are from the point of view of walk the one, the specific chicken. And then at the end, from the point of view of a bunch of chickens at one time, there are transcripts of police interviews. Um, there are, it, it zooms in and out all over. And um, yeah, can you, talk, can you talk about the structure? Yeah, so, okay. So what I imagined was there's this one event that's happening and that is that there's going to be this heist and so it's that happens one night and then it's like i wanted and i wanted that one heist to have huge repercussions not just for janie's life or for you know the life of these chickens or anything like that but i wanted it to be like thousands of years into the future so and for people wanted, who haven't read the book can you just say it's a heist of yeah it's a heist of these activists steal every chicken that's on this one farm or like that's their plan chickens. it's a million chickens working. yeah there's a million chickens they're gonna they're gonna steal a million chickens in one night and there's like a it starts with just janie and then there's more and more and more people who get involved so so i wanted it and i wanted it to be like it was so inevitable that this was going to happen as crazy as it sounded that its origins went back thousands of years as well and that its repercussions would go far into the future which i mean really if you think about it that's just that's just life that's just that's just event that's just event like you and me talking right now you know they're like all of the forces that came together you know to you know you and me be talking in this moment and all the things that will come after it you know it's everything is like that but i wanted this to feel really momentous and so so what i did was i i had it i had all of these different i wanted it to have be like a million different people literally if you think of a chicken as a person um looking at this from all different points of view. So I wanted it to be from the point of view of 
um, you know, chickens. I wanted it to be from the point of view of like the police who showed up on the scene from different activists who were there from like birds that were flying by in the night, like on their way elsewhere, who like alight on a rooftop and then keep going. Like I wanted it to be from the point of view of all of these different things, looking at this one momentous thing that was happening. And, and I, so I wanted to drive toward that event and then I wanted to drive away from that event. And I wanted it to be like, as you got closer to the event, you began to see more and more takes on that event. Um, and so first, first it's just Janie and then Janie makes friends with Cleveland. So then you've got Cleveland there and then they, um, you know, get this other guy, this activist guy in there. So then there's him and then, um, and then there's this, this person who it seems like they're police reports. It turns out since we're giving things away here that, um, it's actually angels because this person is, you know, on the verge of death that we find out late in the book. So, you know, so it just kind of starts widening and widening. Um, and hopefully, you know, we're still feeling the pull of Janie, you know, hopefully Janie is still, you can still hear her voice, you know, saying like, cause it's her idea and her plan. So she's, and it's because she had this vision. So, and then, you know, and then you get the heist and it's in all these different voices. And then as you move away from the heist, um, you know, you, you have these moments where you're going far into the future, you know, thousands of years into the future, um, or even just, you know, weeks, months into the future, years into the future. Um, and, you know, and then you're sort of following Janie. So I thought of it as kind of like this, this, bell curve or like song like there was a song I was always listening to um, to try to kind of get that right get that sound like fugue like the fugue, like a fugue that starts with one kind of strand and then there's like another strand comes in another strand and then they're all playing together and it's cacophonous you know and then one strand drops out and another strand drops out and then like finally you're like back down to just a couple little strands that are sort of trading back and forth and then it kind of ends. So that was sort of what I was imagining. Did you do anything particular process-wise to keep track? Because it will suddenly shoot forward in, in time and then come back and then somebody else's story will shoot forward in time. And sometimes it drops back sort of with the, with the heist, the night of the heist as a heist as a hub. Um, did, you, did you just keep track of that and your notes or did you have a murder board up on your wall or? No, it was a mess. It was such a mess. Yeah, I mean, there's there's really just like five main characters and then there's just some other people who just kind of come in for a minute. And so, yeah, for the five main characters, I wrote out like a full page of what their plot was so that I could, so that was sort of help me because it got a little complicated. And then, um, yeah, so basically for those five main characters, I had scenes where they were, you know, were like living with them in the moment. And then, yeah, you shoot to five years later, you know, he's like on the phone, she's getting out of prison, you know, are they still in love, you know, so I tried to sort of shoot ahead like that. Um, and then, and I just found it so satisfying, like it was so satisfying. I mean, you know, I sit in class and there's all these people like, Who's going to fall in love? <laughs> I hope somebody like I wish that we could like flash into the future. Who's in love? Or, you know, who am I still friends with? Like five years later, he's he's come back. We're having a drink at the beer plant. I'm, you know, he's signing his his new book for me. You know, I just I love I love that kind of move in books like i like edward p jones says it in um one of my favorite novels of all time um the uh um the, the uh the known world the known world yeah um which is kind of funny because the known world i mean we don't know the future and yet he's constantly doing that in the book so um and yeah and people people have played with you know doing that kind of thing so i i really I just loved it. And I loved how um, you can have different registers. So I tried to have it like, maybe you've got one that's exposition kind of, and then you go into like a scene. 
So you have like a scene in the future, but not any exposition around it, just like a scene dropped in. So this makes it sound like it's hard to understand or follow, but it really isn't. I mean. And it's thrilling, those leaps forward in time. Um, but in time, just, yeah, absolutely legible. Can you talk about, sorry, all my questions are, can you, here's something that I loved. Would you talk about that, please? Thank you. Uh, talk about um, writing from the point of view of a chicken and also chickens as a category. Yeah, so I had a very hard time thinking about writing from the point of view of a chicken because yeah, you know, I don't really want to have some cutesy, goofy cartoon chicken in my book. Like that's just that wasn't where I wanted to go with that. So, um, so basically, I mean, I just decided. You know, I did a lot of research. I just read a lot of articles and stuff about the life of the inner life of chickens and books. I read some books on the inner life of chickens, um, and then I tried to be as hands off as I possibly could and just state the few things that I knew. And then I just delved into like a mad fantasy for just a minute, you know, like just mad fantasy where I imagined what chickens think happens when you die. Love that. And so that was my one indulgence. I was just like, I'm just gonna rip off the shirt, you know, and just, just go for it. Like, what do chickens think happens when they die? Um, but I do admit in the book that I don't really know what hap what actually happens to them when they die. Just so, um, and, and then, yeah, I mean, I think that the difference was, so with Block, Block was the chicken who we follow in the book who really only has a few scenes, but they're kind of pivotal and they propel the story. And, um, I mean, I learned a lot about what chicken conversation is like, and I tried to follow it very strictly. I tried to follow, like, I would not have a chicken say something or do something that a chicken would not do, except I did one small thing, which was that I imply, I stated that there is a future tense in chicken conversation, which I actually, I mean, I think that there must be because of the things that they communicate, but I don't know if it's isolated down to a particular kind of chirp, which is what I am, I said in the book, that there is a very specific chirp that a chicken makes to indicate that they're about to say something about the future. Um, and I, that was a lie. But other than that, I tried to keep it really, I really worked hard to not do a lot of anthropomorphizing. I mean, not that I think that that's a sin of some kind, um, but I don't. But um, because actually, I mean, I, I feel I find even that phrase a little bit disingenuous because I actually think that animals have so much more in common with us than we've. I mean, I, I feel like I used to hear that word all the time, anthropomorphizing, and that was like a term that we in in you know in uh grad school would be like do not anthropomorphize anything and and i and I, I i have rebelled against that a little bit at least in my mind because um because we do have a lot in common with animals and animals have language i mean just over the last 20 years we've discovered so much so we could probably get away with a lot more than we do but i did not try to get away with a lot i just found it i just i, just, I didn't want it to seem goofy i didn't want it to detract I see somebody asked how you studied the language of chickens. Oh yeah, well there have been like a, there have been a lot of studies and there have been books that talk about um, you know just about how chickens communicate um, and the, all the different categories of language that they have. Um, you know, like they have conversation about about mating, about fighting, about nesting and raising children and about, um, you know, running from scary things about foraging about I mean, those are all different categories of conversation and they, they talk in different ways about them and talk, the talk isn't, you know, it, it isn't it isn't the way that we talk, but it's different. It's it's different 
different kinds of sounds that emerge from their mouths. And it's also um, the way that they move their bodies and the way that they stand. Um, and it's also, um, you know, um, it's the way that they move around each other. It's just, there's a lot of things that have to do with how they communicate. And, um, and you can isolate, you can, you can tell what a chicken is saying. I mean, I, at the time I decided, I spent a lot of time around chickens while I was writing the book. And I lived near a sanctuary that said I could just come in any time and sit with these chickens. And I would watch them and I could, I could over time begin to see the kinds of things I would read about it. And then I would go and observe and I could, I could see, you know, what they were talking about in a, like a, in a kind of a vague way, you know, nothing too specific. A chicken um, sanctuary. Yeah. Like a, well, an animal sanctuary, a, a, it's a farm animal sanctuary, right? So they've got like cows and, and pigs and then they've got chickens. Yeah. Is this in, in Texas? Did you write most of this book in Texas? No, I mean, I did, I did finish it in Texas. I started it in um, Michigan, where I lived for a year before I came here, um, where Matt was teaching at uh, U of M. Um, and the, another thing is, you know, chickens have names, like they have, they have their own names that they call each other. And that's how I came up with walk. Um, apparently all birds do like, apparently, you know, when birds are settling into the trees at night or waking up in the morning, they're, they're settling into the tree and like calling out their own name. Like, like, it's kind of like I present, you know, Deb present, <laughs> Elizabeth present, you know, and then in the morning, they're like, Deb, Deb, I didn't die in the night. I didn't die in the night. I'm here. <laughs> Nobody ate me still here. Deb, 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 you know, and they sound just slightly different from each other, the sounds. And so, I mean, I can't hear the difference between them, but really, I mean, if you sit and you listen to birds kind of calling back and forth to each other, the, the sounds do sound a little different. Um, they're also like cultural differences. So like chickens from, you know, from like one, one hen house or from, from one, you know, part of Africa or something aren't going to sound the same as, you know, the chickens that are living in Hawaii or something. I mean, their, their conversation will be slightly different. Yeah, makes sense. So someone asked. So, so this is the, the, um, the big Texas read. And I wonder if you've thought about, um, what effect Texas has had on your writing? I mean, a lot. Like, I want to ask you the same thing. Actually, why don't you answer it first? Because yeah, just... this is about this is about you, and I get to ask the questions. <laughs> um, so I feel like um, there's something about the landscape that's affected me a lot. The, the vastness, I mean, you know, you know, I teach at this prison and I have to drive a long way to get there and I spend a lot of time in the car just thinking about what I'm writing when I'm going back and forth and it's so it, it's a lot of small roads it's a lot of tiny highways there are very strange things that I pass along the way like I pass a lot of these giant. Um, you know, I pass factory farms all the time and I pass um, these like ranches where um, where wild animals are kept and yeah, yeah. you can go in. I think I told you about this. You can go in and like shoot a zebra or or something. It's it's like it's so insane. And um, and I told you that I saw a zebra there once um, I saw a zebra just like on the side of the road, on the other side of the barbed wire fence. And it was like, this just I've beautiful animal. What? I've seen that zebra driving to Galveston. There's a, there's a ranch of, wild, of, of exotic animals. And there's often a zebra just there. So I don't know which one, but on the way to Galveston, there is one that's actually a, like kind of a sanctuary or like a preserve. I don't know if that's the one that you pass. I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay, so there's, yeah, there's another one where you can go and just shoot the zebra. So I feel like there's something about the incredible contrast between how I live and the values that I have and um, and um, the things that are important to me and um, 
what I see when I'm driving to the prison and then just being at the prison, it's just had a very, a really big effect on me. It's, it's made me think a lot about, um, about just bigger ideas and writing about bigger things in a lot of ways. So, so I think it has, it has done that for one thing. Um, there are other things that Texas has done. Um, this particular population of writers is, you know, whatever your community is doing, you know, you might kind of fall into a little bit more. I, I feel really influenced by the writers in this community, um, like you um, and Edward and other, like a, just a lot of the writers here. This is my community. Um, so, so I really like that. I love feeling that community. There's, it feels big. It feels, it feels like it feels growing, you know, and the, the, the creative writing programs here, there's just always extra students hanging around. And so it feels very vibrant. So, so it feels kind of important a lot of the time. Um, and, and, and I also think, well, tell me, tell me yours. I, I might have one more thing to say, but I'm still formulating it. It's interesting. So I do, I mean, I find, I find the, the, the teaching so meaningful, both the graduate level and the undergraduate level. I'm feeling very, particularly tender towards my students in the past four or five days since first Dan Patrick announced that he was going to end tenure in public universities at UT. Um, and, and the reason that makes me feel tender to my students, but particularly my undergraduates is that um, if, if he does that, it means they won't get the teachers that they deserve um, because people will not want to come and teach at UT. And then with today's announcement of Greg Abbott wanting to um, report parents of trans children to um, Child Protective Services. And I feel like Texas is full of those contradictions in that, I, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, I, the students are so wonderful and at the undergraduate level largely texan yeah. and um i've always said i really like texans because it's the one part of the country where they'll get your jokes but they'll also be really nice to you in stores and you know i'm from the northeast where they'll get your jokes but they will be horrible to you <laughs> and i went to school in the midwest where they won't get your jokes but they'll be very nice um and i i feel like those contradictions that I feel in Texas all the time have, have have had an effect on my work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a bar that I pass, but when I drive to the prison that has outrageous signs out front every time. I mean, like they're just normal signs for this bar, but one this last time that I went and I've seen this sign before, it said midget wrestling. Like they do midget wrestling at a bar that I pass on the way to the prison. I mean, isn't that incredible? Yes, that's terrible. It's really, it's it's just so it's so disgusting, and so. But at the same time, I don't want to just be like, oh, the state sucks or anything like that because, I mean, you know, not only is this my home, but I love it here. I love Austin. I mean, I drive to the prison and I love the people who I work with there and, you know, and I love my students there and I love, I really love my students here. Man, I've got amazing students this semester and last semester, amazing students. Like, I feel like because we're back in person, even behind a mask, I just love them so much. Like my love for them has just, I always loved them, but now just my love has, I missed you. So it's so much better. Um, I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat because I will ask them. Um, but Deb, I want to ask you, I want to, because the book is also really funny. It's both funny and, and unafraid of heartbreak. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what humor does in a book that is also serious. Um, that 
sorry, I was the questions coming in and I was kind of reading them. So why don't you why don't you say that again? Something about funny and <laughs> you think about... it's funny the questions that you read. <laughs> no, I want I want to hear your question. Um uh no I'm, I'm because the book is both full of jokes and also full of heartache. I just love to hear your thoughts about the use of jokes in a serious book. Oh yeah. You know, I guess that I, it's always been so important to me to do that. Like, I don't, I feel like t tragedy and grief is so much better and more interesting if it's layered in with um, humor that humor makes, puts in, humor can do so many things. Like humor can make it, um, can it increase distance in some way. Like if, if, if you, if like the character just can't get too close to that, you know, you can always like um, have the have the character being funny and that's like creating this distance. And then like that distance can be from the narrator's point of view or from the author or from the, from, from the protagonist's point of view. Like it can be from all of these different, you know, so that's one way you can use it to show grace, you know, like we're moving like in this ugly moment, there's something to laugh at, you know, in this heartbreaking moment, there's still something to smile at, you know, it could, um, I mean, humor can, can, um, can, can make you like someone a little bit more, like if you want someone to be totally disgusting, but they have this one element that's like a little funny, like you just like them a little more. And so there are so many ways that you can use humor. And I mean, I, and I just, I feel like any, any situation is both funny and tragic. Like any, like even just me being here right now is like funny and tragic. I don't know how, but if I thought tragic? about it, for a while, what is it tragic? Well, you know, we're not like the last time when this book came out, we were in person, you know, we were sitting at, at book people and we were, you know, hanging out face to face. And now like, we were a little nervous. We're we were a little nervous about things. Yeah, we were, we were a little nervous. Like what, what was coming you know we had no idea and then here we are two years later here we are sitting in my husband's office you know after how many of these so there's something like a little sad about that a little tragic about it and there's also something a little absurd and funny it's true for example so aaron asks are short stories seeing a resurgence in popularity I didn't know that they didn't have a surgeons. I thought they always had a, a sur I thought they were always a surging in popularity. I love short stories. Are you kidding? I read them all the time. I read one last night. What'd you read? I read the first story in Lee Newman's new book. Um, I think it's called Nobody Gets Out Alive. And it was great. I'm looking forward to that book. So do you think of yourself as you write all sorts of books. You've written um, a little book of short stories that was sold with two other people's books, and then then a, a novel, and then a memoir, mm -hmm. and then another book of short stories, and then a graphic novel, and then I can't novel. believe. Right? I can't believe you know all of this. I can't believe you know this. I'm a, I'm a fan. Um, I'm a huge gen fan. Gen genuinely, and and I'm interested. Do you do you think you do one book at a time, and you think, oh, I'm going to write this in the form that I'm interested in right now, or do you sort of think, oh, I'm going to come up with a new sort of challenge? Because even your your novels and your short story collections are quite different from each other. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that happens. I'm I'm curious how you do yours too. I mean, I have to say like after Barney, you know, it was really hard to start, but it was so fun to finish that I just really want to write another novel. So I'm working on another novel now. I just find novels to be, I love reading novels. 
I love writing novels. I just, I believe in the form so much. I just feel like there's so much to do with a novel. Um, so, so I'm, so at the moment I'm, I'm definitely working on another novel. Um, I mean, they're just, it's, it's like, it's like you've got one tiny thing in your mind, one little image that just snags. And then it's like, you can explode the whole thing into this world that has like stylistic choices and structures and has like everything you ever thought about and that mattered to you. And, you know, it's, and it's just, you can do so much with a novel, like a novel, a novel is an expression of one tiny spark in your brain, but that, but that spark contains everything everything that there is. And so that's the attempt, you know, like, of course we fail, but that's the attempt. And I, I just find that to be so interesting. And you wrote the whole, this, the, the draft of the, I happen to know you finished the draft and you wrote the whole thing by hand, right? I did. Yeah. And now I'm like halfway through the second draft also all by hand rewriting all of it is like ridiculous. I mean, at some point I have to go to the computer, but I mean, really what happened was that during the pandemic, I spent so much time on zoom and doing classes and office hours and, you know, just all of the stuff and meeting with my parents and my, all my old friends, like just everything. I was just, and I just couldn't look at my computer anymore and like see text. It just, it just wasn't happening. I mean, I always wrote by hand anyway, but usually I would write a little, type it in, and then, you know, do some stuff on the computer and some stuff, revisions by hands and stuff. I never did this, what I'm doing now. And I find it, it's so relaxing. Like, it's just so much better, even though it's probably going a little slower because of it. And I don't know, I'm gonna have to find someone to type it all in. I can't, there's no way I can type all that in. It's just so many pages at this stage. Um, do you ever write by hand? No, my handwriting is not legible enough to do it. I mean, I'll write a, I'll write a page or a sentence or I'll take notes, but that's about it. Can you tell us, uh, I wanna know, and so does our wonderful colleague, Jackie, um, if you can tell us anything about the novel. Um, Sure, it is about um, this team who comes down from Mars. They've been up on Mars for a while and they land on Earth and they are traveling across the great desert um, in search of this ark that was buried in the sand. Um, that contains the DNA of all of these extinct animals. And that is their quest. And then it's, that's part, like that's like half of the book. And then the other half is the people who hid it and why they hid it, why they saved it, how it ended up there. Um, but really it's kind of like, it's turning into sort of like a book about sand. Um, I've been doing a lot of research about sand, reading a lot of books about sand. Um, there are a lot of books about sand. There are so many books about sand. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I've got quite a few books about sand. Mm -hmm. So. Sounds great. And you have a book coming out. I do have a book coming out. A new novel coming out. Do you love novels as much as me? I do, I do. Yeah, I like I like the the different things that different lengths of books allow you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I feel like I've learned as I've gotten older to sort of the particular joys of of different of different forms. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about your book? It's coming out. Yeah. It's not about me, it's about you. Yeah, but still, I want to know. I don't even, you haven't even told me. It's, um, tell me a little bit. It, my standard answer lately is that it's a novel about memoir. That's as close as I've gotten to a description of it. Interesting, very interesting. And it has a great title, like I'm nobody's hero or something like that. I'm the hero of the book. The hero of this book. The hero of this book. It's such a great title. Thanks. And even though, 
I want to ask you another question that's in the chat. Okay. Um, I first found your work through the book Minor Robberies. I'm curious to hear your insights uh, into writing such short pieces that feel so packed. How did you select what to keep and what to cut? Is that a process you continue to use or is your process different for your longer form writing? Oh, was a really yeah. good question. That's why I wanted to ask it. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I have pieces that are really short that are just like a couple sentences long. And then I have, you know, these novels. Um, yeah, I mean, generally the little short, short pieces just sort of arrive. Like they, I write them down, um, but I write down a lot of them. Like I might write down a hundred short shorts wow. um, over like a couple of months. And then maybe I keep 10 and most of them I just throw away. So you don't, um, do you keep them in any form to go back to or think about? I mean, they're, they're in the notebooks in case I want to go back. But so, I mean, I have, cause I write in a notebook, but, um, but I do go back a lot thinking, man, I did all that writing. Like there's gotta be something else in there, but no, they're never good. And it's never a good idea when I pull them out. Like sometimes, sometimes something will fit into a scene for a novel or something, but almost never, like basically they're just not good. Um, they're like exercises, you know, I love exercises. So, um, so yeah, so a few of them end up, and then the ones that are there, they're mostly formed. Like I do make a few revisions, but if I mess with them a lot, it messes them up. There's some kind of like interior structure. There's something like that I'm hearing. And if I play with it too much, then I make it more like readable or something. And then it feels tin, it feels phony. Hmm. Um, so I don't like that. So I just, so I try not to mess with them too much. Or I do mess with them too much, but then I wind up looking at the original and I'm like, oh, the original is definitely better. So, so that's what happens there. And then like with longer stories, um, a lot of times it's like, it starts kind of small and then I add a bunch of stuff and it grows out and I'm like, okay, here, I've got it. And then and then I add a lot more and then I send it out and people are like, this is terrible. And then I'm like, oh man. And then I go back and like the medium, the medium one, the one like in the middle was much better. And so that happens to me quite a bit. So does that happen to you? I, I almost never go back and look at stuff that I get rid of, but I also don't ever write things I always think when I'm writing something this is it this is you know I'm just this is the one I'm going to get right in one go um and so I tend I don't work well from exercises mm. I somehow just have to believe I'm writing the best thing I'm ever going to write <laughs> every time I start something and so then when I get rid of stuff because I I'm very inefficient and I write pages and pages I don't use. Um, yeah, it's, I, I walk away as though from a car crash and don't look <laughs> over my shoulder. And then like an action hero, it blows up behind me and I just keep walking. And then, <laughs> and then you go back and revise? I, I go back and revise, but I also just cut stuff and don't. Oh, you just, oh, that's interesting. So you just go and you write pages and pages and pages, and then you go back and you slim it down to like a skeleton. Or yeah, just, kind of. Yeah. That's interesting. And then you don't, and then you don't add a bunch of new stuff. No, I add, I add yeah, I do add some new stuff, but I'm always, I, I'm on a conveyor belt and I don't, I'm just trying to go forward. That's good. That's really good. I should do that. I'm going to ask you, we're, we're coming towards the end of our time, Deb. Yeah, we're almost done. I'm going to ask you a question from David. Do you think you're always in conversation with the last book that you wrote? Wow, that's a good question that we should both answer. Um, I would say no, not really. I mean, that's not to say that I've never done that, but mostly I 
And mostly I don't really do that very much. Like I'm in conversation by that time. I'm, kind of, I'm like, I don't want to even want to think about that last book. So it's like, I'm in conversation with a lot of other things that are on my table or in my mind or, or other books that I'm, you know, reading. So no, usually it's, I'm not, are you? No. Um, but I, I was wondering how you, two years on, almost exactly two years on, how your feelings about Barnate have changed, or if they have? Well, only in the sense that I feel, you know, I mean, I just, I, I still like it, and that's good, you know? I can't always say that. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I pretty much stand, I stand behind my stuff. Um, so I still like it. I think that if if my feelings have changed at all, it's just that um, I I feel like I'm ready. I'm ready for the next book. Like I'm just I'm ready for the next book. Like I'm very excited about the one that I'm working on now, and I'm working really hard on it every day. And so Barn Eight feels. Um, but you know what though? When I look at it, I brought it out. You know, just in case and. Uh, and I just, I love the cover. It's so sweet. I do really, I still really love the cover. I pick it up and I'm like, yeah, and it's kind of hefty. Like I still very much like it. Um, and um, so that's really nice. And I still, yeah. Can I say the audio book? Cause I, I read it two years ago and then to prepare for this, I listened to the audio book. Wow. I haven't even listened to it. How is it? It's fantastic. Oh, and they do. Um, the reader does a really good job with the different um, the different format, so that you it's quite distinct and beautiful and interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's lovely. That's great. That's why I got <laughs> Walk's name wrong because I didn't hear the B when she read it. I heard it as Walk. Oh, I Walk. I the B. Oh, that's so that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, fantastic. it's, it's been really fun because so okay, so it's been optioned, you know, by searchlight. And now they've got like a director and a writer working on it. And so I, I am meeting with them. And um, we keep having these conversations about like, what would a chicken do? And like, what would a chicken not do? And, and stuff like that. And it's been it's been so fun to just like hear these other professionals like interpretations about what's going on and like what's important in the book. And, and I, I thought of that just because of the, um, the audio book, because I've been way too scared to listen to even like they sent me a free version or whatever, like a link. And I've just been too scared to listen to it because if, if I didn't like it, that would just be so horrifying. So I'm can, really glad to hear that it's good. It might like be like seeing a picture of yourself taken from an angle that you're not used to, but it's, yeah, it, it's, it, it's really terrific. That's good. Deb, I've loved talking to you. We said I, we're gonna go. I said, I'm a public librarian. I'm gonna make this run for an hour. We've been here for a little more, um, but I've loved it. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm just so appreciative of you taking out this time and doing this with me. And thanks to everybody for coming and and thank you to David and to everybody else. This has been really, really fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, this has been great. Thank you guys for coming. Do we stay on for a second and say goodbye? You can stay on for as long as you'd like. You can just <laughs> thank hang you out for being here. Yeah. You can hang out with us for the postmortem if you want, or you can if you're tired. You can say goodbye. I'll it's say totally on up to you. A second, I am seeing some uh, yes. some other. Go through the yeah. Go through the chat. I'm scanning through the chat here. It was weird to see. It's like it was weird. Hi, Amanda. Yay! Y'all have a lot of fans out there. Yeah, there were there were a lot of people who I think who were in our program who were in both who have been both of our students. I think because I saw a bunch of names from 
Um, ah, yeah, there's... one of your students from Chicago thanked you. Can't find her name now. Yeah. That was a great, great, great conversation, by the way. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so great. much, you guys. That was really, yeah. really fun. Are we still, can they still see us? Can everybody still see us? I guess we should just go. I'm going <laughs> to, admissions time. I'm going to rush off to read a, some finalists. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks so much, Thanks, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. It was great. Yeah, thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. It was a joy. Thank you. Yay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. It was great. Thanks. Bye, Deb.